As I was saying, our relationship with uh, the university through our Brookings Mountain West partnership is one that has been really enriching for me and I think really enriching to the university community. And one of the areas of research that we have at Brookings is on media studies. And so it's obviously something that is important and of interest to all of you. Uh, but I'm new to it, as I said. Uh, this was not a project on explanatory journalism that I was planning on doing. I had a colleague who was planning on doing it, but uh, there were some uh, health issues in his family and he was unable to, to carry out the project and so it fell to me, which at first I thought, well, you know, doing a, a colleague I like a favor, we'll get through this and, and get the deliverable out the door and that'll be it. But what I found was it ended up being a really fascinating project and one that at first, I didn't think really related to my research interests, which um, obviously sounded in the introduction pretty different from this project and from the types of things you guys do. Um, and I didn't really think it was awfully related to my work, but as I got into it, I realized that both, both of those things were false. It's, it's an integral part of my work. Um, it's a, a very important part of how I package and present the research that I do on a daily basis. And one of, my other, uh, one of the other hats I wear at Brookings is I edit uh, a blog there. Blogging is obviously a really important part of getting information out in a lot of contexts, and Brookings has really committed itself to blogs. So about a year and a half ago, oh gosh, two and a half years ago now, we launched FixGov, which is a blog available on the Brookings website. I encourage all of you to read it, especially if you have an interest in politics and public policy, and is being named editor of that blog was fun and exciting and terrifying all at once because I'd never done anything like it. And what I realized was that I could be an academic and write for this blog, but the editing side of it really required my thinking like a journalist, like a communications professional, like an editor at a newspaper. So you throw yourselves into thinking about what's going to get you clicks, what's going to get you search engine optimized, how do you uh, pitch ideas to people to write on things that you think are going to be important? How do you make it timely? One of the challenges I think that happens in uh, the ivory tower, in research institutions, in universities, is that people are writing and researching on really interesting and really important things, but people aren't reading them, either because they're framed wrong, or they're packaged wrong, or they're released at the wrong time. We had, a, for example, yesterday on the blog, we had a set of blog posts that we had planned to uh, release, but the president picked a new Supreme Court nominee. Uh, so we had to find someone to write on that, and then we also had to delay the two posts that we had planned. If you don't think like that, of course, then content gets lost. It never gets clicked on, and then, then that information doesn't go out to as many people as, as you would expect. And so as I got into more uh, thinking more about media studies, I realized there really is an important relationship uh, to, to, to my work. So this project on explanatory journalism is something that's important, I think, from a media perspective, but it's also important for a think tank like Brookings, like Brookings Mountain West and the Lindsay Institute, and, and for a variety of other research institutes um, around the country and around the world. Our job at Brookings is to help explain things. Sometimes we do it well, sometimes we do it less well, and sometimes we can do it better just by, as I said before, reframing or repackaging what we're going to do or how we're going to say it. And as we, we jumped into this project, I recognized I don't know that much about explanatory journalism, so let me talk to people who do. And so as part of the project, I uh, leaned on a few people who I thought were, uh, came to explanatory journalism or took part and engaged in explanatory journalism in different ways, from different angles, but very effectively. So I interviewed David Leonard from the New York Times Upshot blog, Ezra Klein, the founder of Vox, uh, Amber Phillips, a, a former Las Vegas uh, native and Las Vegas Sunwriter, who's now writing for The Fix at Washington Post, and Max Ehrenfreund, who's uh, another writer at The Washington Post. Each of them have very different backgrounds, each of them have very different roles, but each of them engages in some way or another in explanatory journalism. And so rather than defining what is this sort of mushy term, uh, from my perspective, I figured it would be easier uh, to rely on them to see their take on it.
In a lot of journalism, there is a need to say that what happened today is the most important thing. And explanatory journalism is more willing to say, hey, you know, what happened today is important in these ways, and it's not important in these other ways, and let's put those into context for you. You know, I'd almost explain it as, as journalists wanting to be your friend at the bar and say, hey, this is the way a story is playing out. This is the way a politician, you know, the methods he or she is using to get what they want. I think that what ends up separating explanatory pieces from non-explanatory pieces is not how well they deliver the core piece of information, but how well they deliver the contextual information necessary for whatever the new piece of uh, information is to make sense. If you look at some of the most read pieces of New York Times journalism over the last couple years, they include a lot of explanatory journalism. They include a really wonderful morphing Q&A, highly visual, that my colleagues on the graphics staff did about Ebola. They include work about ISIS. They include all kinds of things that really are explanatory journalism. They are not mostly saying, this happened yesterday. They are mostly saying, let me help you make sense of the world. In terms of why more people in the media are trying to talk about it and put labels on it, I think it's because the media is trying to recategorize itself, to understand at this moment um, as we talk, what are the trends, what is rising in relative importance and, and, and falling in relative importance. And I think one thing that's rising is explanatory journalism. And I think the reason it's been rising is that different kinds of technological trends have just made it easier to do good explanatory journalism at a faster clip and reach more people with it. If you make your writing more accessible and you format your work in a more accessible way, more people are going to read it, more people are going to learn from it. And in an era in which information is politicized and there are fewer and fewer checks on the legitimacy and accuracy of information, making sure that you are getting the word out, if you're doing good work, if you're doing solid, independent, and interesting work, getting that work out there in front of pe people is going to help combat misinformation, politicized information, or just frankly information that's wrong, or filling in gaps where uh, information maybe doesn't exist in, in as accurate or clear of a way as, as you would like or, or you would want. And so what a lot of uh, the four people, or, or I guess three of them were in that video, Max uh, is in some of the others, you can, you can find these on the Brookings website, what they, what they explained was uh, sort of interesting. That is that in some ways all journalism is explanatory journalism. And I was chatting yesterday with Tom Gorman, the editor um, at uh, the Las Vegas Sun, and he, he said just that. He said, well, you're, you're looking at explanatory journalism. All of it is explanatory. And that's true to some extent. But when you start to look at the good, solid pieces of work in this area, the ones that help guide you through a, a, uh, a tough story or a, or a tough concept, the ones who deliver uh, a load of information, but not with tremendous expectations about pre-existing knowledge. That's good work. That's really solid work, and it's work that, that makes a difference. For other types, of, uh, other types of journalism, for instance, it's not explanatory. It still provides a really important role. It provides the information necessary, uh, but it does so in, in a very different way than explanatory journalism does. Explanatory journalism is hard because you have to be a good writer, you have to be a good journalist, and you also have to know a ton about the topic that you're talking about far and beyond the, the words that end up on a page or the words that end up on a screen. And so it, in some ways you have to be an expert in your, in your craft as a journalist. You also have to be an expert in some area of policy or some area of uh, a topic that you're working on. That makes your life much harder. Um, and, it, and the people who do it well, it is extraordinarily impressive. Uh, some of the people here are, are ones who either do it well or oversee people who are, who are doing it quite well. Um, but even if you go to Vox or Upshot or that, you look at it and you look at some of their content and it's crap, to be honest, because they miss the mark. They don't do it well. And, and Ezra and, and David were uh, among the first to admit that. You know, sometimes we, we nail it and then sometimes we completely miss the mark. And part of explanatory journalism uh, is is learning from those mistakes. And in the new media environment that exists, in the new ways in which 
uh, this type of journalism is coming to consumers, is coming to readers, is coming to viewers, uh, that lesson learning is critically important. But explanatory journalism is more than just the stories that are being written or the packaging of those stories or the people doing the writing. They have a really important role in the new media model. And so what I did was I asked uh, these experts, we'll call them, uh, a variety of questions about what it means for your, for your business, right? WAPO has gone through an ownership transformation uh, since Jeff Bezos has bought it. Vox is brand new. New York Times has been fairly stable, but it's starting to look a little different than it has. And all of these organizations are facing the realities of the new media environment, the new media environment from a financial perspective, and that is it's hard to get viewers to come to your pages, to particularly to buy uh, your work in print, and to keep staff. And so I asked them, what, what does explanatory journalism do to help that? Does it transform the media model? Does it fit into the new media model? Does it help readers? Or is it, is it a liability? Is it something you do that other parts of the, uh, the paper or the website have to pay for? And they said that it was, it, it, almost to a T, each of them said, explanatory journalism is fascinating because you get tremendous loyalty from readers. Readers keep coming back to you because they trust you. They trust not only you as a journalist, but that the information that you're providing is something that they're going to learn from. And for the people who do that well, they're going to get more loyalty. And those, that greater loyalty means more clicks, more sales, and it helps what is a really struggling industry uh, come, out, uh, come out of uh, what is uh, an environment or a period of time where there are a lot of questions on the money side and not a ton of answers. When you have someone like Jeff Bezos, an extraordinarily successful billionaire, buying a newspaper like this and trying his best to turn it around and seeing that he's hitting struggles, that he's having struggles, it really puts into perspective how difficult figuring out these questions are. If someone like Bezos can't do it, you know, God help the discipline. But it seems like he's doing a pretty good job, and he has some really good staff under him who are helping that uh, become a reality. Beyond the, uh, beyond the financial aspect of it, explanatory journal journalism also has a democratic value. And for a place like Brookings, that's, that's really in our wheelhouse, trying to figure out what kinds of democratic benefits can be gained from work like this. And as I said before, one thing that this type of journalism can do is really add detail, really add nuance, really add uh, truth and honesty in reporting and in information. And that's all great for a consumer, and that's great for the institution producing it, but it but for the democracy, it's critical. It's absolutely essential that citizens have access to accurate and informed information so that then they can, uh, as democratic citizens, be more informed and make better decisions about voting, about policy. Um, here in this state, you have a lot of referenda on the ballot uh, coming up in November. And making sure that you have all of the information is part on, partly on you, partly on doing your own research, but as you look around town at the various newspapers, if they can provide that information accurately for you, it makes your life easier. It makes your choices, uh, your uh, right choices, a little easier to find. And so from, as I said, from a democratic perspective, this type, all type of, all journalism is important for democracy, but this type is particularly true. As part of the project, I invited a few other, beyond the people you'll see on video, I invited a few other people to blog for us, to talk about uh, putting these issues into context. Uh, essentially, exactly what David uh, was saying in the video, adding context, adding nuance to an idea is explanatory journalism. So we took that model and we applied it uh, to, this, uh, to this project. And one of the people who blogged for us was the uh, Deputy Vice President of Communications for Brookings, one of my my colleagues, Richard Fawal, and he talked a lot about fact check sites and how explanatory journalism really can play a role in, as I said earlier, combating misinformation on the internet. The challenge now is that it is very difficult to identify what is phony and what is true, what's a legitimate news source and what is a front for something else. It's also difficult to, especially as mainstream media organizations get into uh, new types of, of uh, media and packaging, like blogging, like other types of uh, 
uh, formats like that, it's hard to distinguish who has talent and who doesn't just by a byline or just by the, the banner at the top or the headline. And so until you get to know these people and get to know their work, it's much more difficult to distinguish the good from the bad. And sometimes it's impossible to distinguish the good from the bad. And so misinformation gets out there. And Richard talked a lot about how this context, this trust building, this approach to journalism is absolutely essential, um, not just with the new media model, like I said before, but the new information environment that exists. And so the other important part of this, I think, too, is uh, explanatory journalism is not just something that's internal to, uh, to media. It's something that everyone who writes, everyone who produces information can take lessons from this that will make uh, their work stronger and, frankly, their lives a little easier. So as I said at the outset, explanatory journalism is something that, that, I like to, that we like to do at Brookings. It's, it's part of our task. It's part of our mission. But it is not something that everyone does and not something that everyone does well. And so the explanatory side is easy for us. Uh, we're, we're, we're eggheads at heart. We, we write long white papers. We write books, some of them more interesting than others. And what we found recently, though, is the number of people who actually down, download a 40-page white paper is quite small. But if you can break that down into 800, 1,000, 1,500 words, you have a much higher probability of more people reading it and, ta and taking away from it the lessons that you want them to learn. So you provide that format, you provide that white paper, and people are going, some people are going to read it, the people who have the patience for it, but the people who don't have the patience or the time or the level of interest are going to work their way through a blog. And so making sure that you package that blog in an effective way to provide all of the relevant information um, without as much of the background that would be in, in a paper is, is critical. And so for me, um, again, as someone who edits a blog, but also as someone who does a lot of longer form writing, being able to bridge that gap is key. And so what do I do when, I'm, when I have questions or I'm uh, curious about what will be the best way to get my work out there? I look to journalists. I look to how they're doing it. I look at their best practices. No one does it better than them. And some days, no one does it worse than a think tank. And so being able to apply those ideas, those approaches to our own work has been absolutely essential. And so let me give you an example of a way in which this has been important for me. I do a lot of research on the presidency. I do a lot of research on executive power and, and legislative executive relations. But one other area of research that, that I do quite a bit of work in is on marijuana legalization policy. It's something I came to uh, right after Colorado and Washington legalized adult use marijuana in 2012. And I've been writing fairly consistently over time on a variety of topics related to adult use, to medical, to state federal relations, uh, on a variety of topics. And so as I'm working through this, as I'm working through some of the projects around this, I came upon a topic that no one seemed to know much about, and I certainly didn't. And it was around drug rescheduling. So as a very quick bit of background, the Controlled Substances Act uh, regulates drugs in the United States almost, almost single-handedly. Under the Controlled Substances Act, there are five schedules in which drugs are put into. Each of those schedules makes a determination on the drug based on its likelihood of abuse, its uh, use for, uh, in medicine, and its ability to be used safely in a medical procedure. So marijuana is a Schedule I drug. That means a few things. One, it means that it's illegal in all circumstances in the United States. You might go elsewhere in the United States, and that doesn't seem to be a reality, but federal law says that. Beyond that, it says that it has no accepted medical use, it can't be used safe, safely in any medical procedure, and it has a high risk of uh, abuse and addiction. Those are political determinations made by Congress about uh, marijuana. A lot of people disagree with those. So one way to change that is to move marijuana from, its, from one schedule to another, or remove it from the schedules entirely. So I started to hear a lot of stories from advocates and from others about how rescheduling works. Now, there's a lot of things that are, that are uh, screwy in, in public policy and, and in terms of federal how the federal government works, but the number of different stories I heard about how rescheduling works could not possibly be true. So, 
I looked into it. I, I jumped into uh, figuring out how rescheduling works. And it made sense that it was so, so difficult for people, that people had so many stories, because the way it works is prescribed within the Controlled Substances Act, and the, the legislative language is a little cloudy. It's a little murky. And I think if you're not used to reading legislation, particularly legislation from the 1970s, um, it was difficult to navigate. So my research assistant and I, uh, you know, ripped it all apart and figured out how this works and talked to some experts and talked to some others and wrote a white paper. And within that white paper was a graphic. And the graphic was just a flowchart that explained how rescheduling worked. Now that's something you can pick up, you can look at for three minutes, and you can completely understand how rescheduling works. Or you could re read the blog post that's attached to it. It's about 1,500 words, a little longer for a blog post than, than I normally like, but again, a pretty complex subject. And you can read through that if you have the patience and have a better understanding of how rescheduling works. Or there's a white paper, which is about 15 pages. Um, so there's all different ways that we package essentially the same ideas and the same information. That graphic is now the standard in the, in the industry and in the uh, policy community to understand how it works. No one had done that before. No one had simply just looked at the law and written up an easy to understand flowchart. So we, uh, my research assistant Grace and I, we get calls from uh, the executive branch, from uh, congressional staff, from states, from advocacy organizations. Um, sometimes just to thank us for doing the work, but oftentimes to engage us on exactly um, how, the process, how each stage of the process works. Sometimes they have follow-up questions. Sometimes they're asking about the current petition that's before the Drug Enforcement Agency and uh, FDA about rescheduling marijuana. Sometimes they ask if uh, we'd be willing to meet with other organizations or other people just to try to get the word out, just to uh, try to get people to understand how this works. We could have gone about explaining this in, in a variety of ways, but right from the outset, we wanted an explanatory journalism approach to be the one that, that uh, really uh, served as the platform for, for this message, knowing that there was a real appetite for this information. And coming from an organization like Brookings, uh, the brand helps, right? It, it, you, you guys are in journalism. You know that the brand of the uh, organization who you're working for or writing for can really matter in terms of the ability of your work to get out there, regardless of its quality. And so the Brookings brand behind an explainer like that was absolutely essential. And from that, we learned uh, we learned a lot of lessons about packaging our own research. And so I work really closely with my communications director and her deputy. At Brookings, we have a central communications staff as well, and we work really hard with them. And they're much more knowledgeable about this stuff, this packaging, than I am, and that really any of my colleagues are. We, I only have a few colleagues who have a background in journalism. Their stuff gets read quite well, and that's not an accident. And so I have to... Uh, work really closely with our um, communications professionals who are absolutely outstanding individuals uh, to make sure that uh, good work gets read, gets read by a lot of people. And so uh, the rescheduling piece was the fifth highest read piece um, at Brookings last year. Uh, there were certainly better pieces that Brookings put out than that one. I'm proud of it, but there's stuff that tackles much bigger issues, um, offers uh, information on a variety of topics that are uh, much more life and death than rescheduling marijuana. But if the packaging doesn't work and the writing isn't that great and they're not telling a compelling story, then people aren't going to get past the first page. And so all this is to say that I think we talk a lot about, and I've, I've said the term several times today, we talk about a new media environment, we talk about new media models, but really there is a new information environment in which a lot of us who are in very different disciplines um, really start to take lessons from each other and really start to emulate each other. There are days where I write like a college professor and then there are days when I write like a journalist certainly without as much polish as you guys. Um, it, thankfully, I have an editor who just cuts all of the fluff out whenever, whenever I'm uh, writing it. But I try to write like you guys. I try to write in a more compelling and accessible way. And when I get it right, the content does well. When I don't get it right, and there are plenty of days that that's true, uh, the, the content isn't, it doesn't perform as well. And 
talking to Ezra and David and Amber and Max, uh, they said sort of the same thing, it, it just from the opposite direction. They said, you know, we're trained in journalism, and most of them are. We're trained in journalism, but if we want to write long form, detailed, nuanced work, we have to think like you. We have to think like policy researchers. We have to be able to understand statistics. We have to be able to understand a research design or the way that modeling is happening for um, quantitative analysis. They need to take lessons from a place like Brookings, and Brookings absolutely has to take lessons from a place like WAPO, a place like New York Times, a place like Vox. And at the end of the day, when we do that, the information is stronger. It helps us, uh, I mean, it helps us from a financial perspective in the same way that it helps um, media outlets from a financial perspective. And all of it together adds to the type of uh, democratic advancements that good information, good journalism, good writing, and good work uh, do. So I'm a half hour in, and I'd love to entertain any questions that you guys have on the topics that I discussed, or frankly, whatever topics you want to ask about. Or I can keep talking. Yeah. Sure. So in terms of the media studies, I'm going to plan a, a series of uh, shorter projects over the next, not starting now, but in the next 12 to 18 months uh, that looks at media coverage of the 2016 campaign. This is something that is obviously a huge, a huge topic right now. I will be one of many, many people uh, working on this for sure. But essentially, one of the things that's important is um, how did Donald Trump come to be, right? And in many ways, he is a media-driven individual, or his success has been uh, largely media-driven. No one gets more airtime than him. There's a lot of reasons for that. But at the same time, uh, he is a master of using media, and he knows timing, he knows outlets, he knows words, he knows how to get a camera pointed at him when they're starting to point the other way. And so love Donald Trump, hate Donald Trump, or if you're the very rare individual and have no opinion of Donald Trump, uh, you have to look at what he's done with media in this cycle and be entirely impressed that a political novice can be that successful at what is really difficult work, and that is capturing media attention. You have a slate of former presidential candidates now with much more experience, much more experience dealing with media in a political context, and none of them could even hold a candle to, to Donald Trump. So understanding how that happens, how that is allowed to happen, what sort of forces uh, generate the uh, media interest in him and in his candidacy, I think are, are pretty important. Part of that is going to be looking at why Donald Trump uh, came to be, like I said, but part of it too is going to examine how that can be avoided in the future. Uh, that Donald Trump is doing well is not necessarily an inherently bad thing, but that he is dominating all media coverage at the expense of other candidates in ways that we know from research uh, the public uses media um, to uh, as shortcuts for information. They don't go and read everything that a candidate has on their website. They don't watch every candidate's speech. They don't watch every debate. But they're going to read blogs. And so, and they're going to read news articles, and they're going to watch video clips. And so, if, if that is happening at the expense of other quality candidates, then that presents a challenge as well. And so a few postmortems of the 2016 race uh, will be good. I was talking to Bill today. Um, I'll be back in the fall uh, in a, f a few weeks around the debate. And one of the things that we'd like to do as part of that trip is actually to assemble a panel of uh, journalists um, and some others to talk about media coverage up to that point. So sometime in mid-October um, when things are, are really interesting at that, at that point. Uh, figuring out what's going on, how it's different, how the 2016 campaign is maybe not so different from other ones, how the candidates, the, um, uh, the two parties' nominees, uh, are being covered, how they're being watched, how they're being written about. I think there's going to be a lot to talk about um, either way. Trump is likely to be the Republican nominee, and so continuing that conversation around uh, his candidacy is important. Uh, Clinton, the coverage of Clinton will be interesting as someone who has been uh, 
around media and in the public eye for quite some time. I think there is a lot of uh, uh, interest in looking at how uh, sexism plays into the coverage of a female presidential candidate. That would be an interesting topic to cover as well. Uh, but as I said, postmortems around 2016, and then uh, moving forward from there, how the media uh, works to put information out there about the president's first 100 days. That's a really uh, information-heavy, complex period of time in a new administration. Policy ideas are coming out. Staff, uh, you know, uh, appointments are being made. Uh, the public is getting bombarded with information, and the ability. Uh, for media organizations to uh, wade through all of that information and present it to the public in a way that's digestible to them. Uh, if they can do it well, is great. If they, if they don't do it well, uh, the president's first 100 days looks pretty disastrous uh, compared to if, if uh, media covers that in a, in a more effective way. That said, it might be disastrous because of the president, but uh, the coverage of it matters too. Yes? Yeah, it's dead in the water. He's not going to be out in the Supreme Court. He, uh, uh, he is, I think the president nominated probably the best individual he could to shine a light on uh, congressional dysfunction and the uh, politicization of the nomination process. It, uh, judge, uh, the judge is a moderate um, by, by today's standards. Uh, he is uh, substantially older than most new Supreme Court picks. He's someone who has had pretty broad support even among Republicans uh, in Congress. And if they don't hold a hearing for him, uh, I think there are some political benefits uh, for Democrats. Uh, I'll say I've, I've also written uh, on the topic to say that there are real political benefits for Republicans in not holding a hearing either. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's going to be a really effective uh, judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and, and not on the Supreme Court. The next president will pick that person. Yeah. Uh, with social media right now, um, how do you keep track or what's the criteria to keep the good blogs or the ones that can help you out with your information? Sure. Um, social media has been uh, such an interesting part of uh, the, the dissemination of information uh, over the past 10 years. It's been a really interesting part for, for my work. When I started at Brookings, I knew what Twitter was in the abstract. I had no idea how it worked. Uh, they really encourage us to use uh, newer forms of social media, though I guess Twitter is not really new anymore. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice way to, to get your work out there. Um, but it's really difficult, again, to wade through good and bad information, good and bad blogs. In 147 characters, anything can look uh, above board. Anything can look legitimate. Anything can look accurate. It can also look like garbage, too. But it's harder to distinguish those, uh, those, different, uh, those different types of work, that di uh, those different types of outlets. What I find the best way to uh, work through that, to address those challenges, is to rely on people who you trust. So Twitter, if, if anything, is a community. And so if I see information getting retweeted by Ezra or by David or by Amber, they know media organizations a whole lot better than I do. And so I'm going to trust that they're retweeting decent content. If I see something that uh, pops up from you know, someone with uh, zero Twitter followers and, you know, that they're following 500 people and it looks like it's a legitimate, uh, a legitimate tweet, you sort of question what, what that tweet is about, what the, the link that's attached, whether that's a, a real source or not. Some places are really easy to figure out um, what's good and what's bad, uh, but, but that's increasingly more difficult. What I, like I said, what I find is uh, the people who are in the know, the people who know uh, these, these groups, are extraordinarily careful about what they're retweeting, and uh, which is so odd, right? It, it's so bizarre that you are so careful over 
what you do on Twitter it, to the point of, I don't want to retweet something that's silly, it could be disastrous for me, that something that is seemingly so minor can have such major effects. But it can, and it's your brand. I have a brand, Brookings has a brand, these journalists have a brand, and any threats to that is a real challenge. So I'm very careful on Twitter um, as a result of that. And uh, in fact, my favorite line is, when I first started, I, I went to my communications director and I said, I have a question. I, I'm not sure if this tweet is a little too much or it crosses a line. And her response was, if you're asking, it is. And, and so, but that's all to say, uh, the importance of, of how you present yourself on social media is, is so key, and the people who care a lot about it are the people to watch and follow and, and take lessons from. Sir. Um, so we're all journalism students, mm -hmm. and you with your great background in political research, um, what kind of like tips, advice would you give us um, when covering like political general elections, caucuses, um, candidates? What are some things that you feel that we should into or avoid? Sure. So there, there are two really good areas to uh, sort of two approaches to take when studying the real horse race of politics. And one is covering what everyone is talking about and adding some sort of uh, new angle to what everyone is talking about. It's hard to avoid writing about Donald Trump. It's hard to avoid writing about what has been an unbelievable rise in support for Bernie Sanders from where he was you know, 12, 14 months ago. It's hard to avoid writing about um, the idea that Hillary Clinton is almost certain to become the Democratic nominee. Uh, it's, it's, hard to write about, it's hard to avoid writing about the collapse among so many really qualified Republican candidates who just spent tens of millions of dollars and got nothing out of it. So these, these ideas that you're going to be in, in pretty hearty competition with a lot of people about. Like I, I said in response to your question, I'm going to write a, po a media post-mortem on the 2016 race. So are a lot of people. Mine has to be better than a lot of people's or it's just going to get lost. And so when you, I think there's often a fear of writing about what everyone is talking about because there's such an information overload. But thinking, of, like I said, about a new angle or a new approach or a new perspective on it, rather than just straight reporting, right, which has its important place for sure. Um, if you take an explanatory, uh, the approach of explanatory journalism, through that nuance and through that detail, you can get readers thinking about something in a very different way uh, than they were thinking about it. So here's an example. One of the, uh, one of my roles, uh, it, on my blog is to write rapid reactions. So a lot of times, this is just the equivalent of straight reporting. It's breaking news style writing, but in a blog format. And uh, one thing I actually learned from journalists who I talk to is, uh, if you know what's gonna happen, write about that breaking news way in advance. So you write your article, you know, six, eight, 10 hours before it has to post. Um, and then just pray that things don't work out in the direction you didn't expect. So. The other night I wrote um, a reaction to the primaries and it did fine, but it didn't really add much to the conversation. And so the post that did okay, you know, got, I don't know, 10,000 hits or something like that um, is, is fine, but I didn't find that sweet spot. The, um, after the South Carolina primary, I wrote a different piece that took a very different, s sort of controversial angle, um, but it was one that many people weren't thinking in those terms. That blew up. It had 50,000 hits in a couple of hours, uh, which is uh, tremendous traffic for a blog of our size. And so, uh, yeah, it, part, of, part of the straight reporting is, is writing what everyone's talking about, but trying to do it in sort of a unique um, or, or thoughtful, thought-provoking way. The other avenue is to write about what no one is talking about or finding the angle in advance that you think is going to be, that you, is a sleeper issue or is something that uh, is just sort of standing out there with all the li lights on it but no, no one discussing it. Those are harder to find with uh, how much coverage is happening around the 2016 race. But when you find it, you can, uh, you're really providing a service to your readers. 
uh, because they can't find that information anywhere else. And sometimes writing like that motivates other people to start writing on it, which is also a good thing. Your work and its progeny is only going to inform the public more. But the challenge at the end of the day for a topic like uh, the 2016 race is just so many people are talking about it that it's really hard to stand out. And it's, certain, it's uh, near impossible to stand out every day. And, uh, and that's often tempered by the platform that you're writing from and the ability uh, for, for you to get that message out. But uh, it's not to say to, uh, it's something to avoid, it's a topic to avoid. Uh, again, talking to the editor at The Sun yesterday, he was talking about um, uh, one of his writers who s he said did the best explanatory journalism uh, content that his paper had, and it was someone who took a deep dive into ACA and just learned everything she needed to know about the Affordable Care Act and what it meant for Southern Nevada, what it meant for Nevada in general, and she spent two years writing on nothing else. That's tough. I mean, that's, if, if you're not that type of journalist who, who can really focus, if you, you're someone who needs to spice things up topically, that's, that's a tough slog. But if you, if you do have that issue-based attention, uh, then you become the person. And the person's name is escaping me, but uh, she is apparently the go-to source for this information in all of Nevada. And so building that type of brand on an issue means that uh, whenever anyone wants background, whenever anyone wants uh, a connection made, you're the go-to person, and then it's much easier for you to stand out. You can do that on an issue like ACA that's really wonky and that a lot of the discussion around it was political and not policy-oriented. It's even harder for, uh, it's much harder for something like uh, the 2016 race. Yes? Sure. So one of the things that I talk to uh, the the guys uh, guys and, and women on on video about was exactly that. Who does this pitch toward, and who uh, who's reading this? And what I found was everyone is reading it, but it depends on how you put it out there. And uh, David Leonard in one of the videos said it better than anyone, and he said. At the New York Times, the upshot in particular, when they first started, they were too focused on this idea that we're going to do this deep dive work, we're going to put it in as punchy of a way as possible, so it was going to be 800 words in a graphic. He said, well, not everything needs to be 800 words in a graphic. He said, some things need to be a bit longer, some things can be 200 words in three or four graphics and provide that same level of detail and nuance as something that's longer form. Sometimes you don't need any, any column space. Sometimes you just need a flow chart or an explainer chart or something like that, uh, or a really effective uh, interactive or a video. Um, I came to this thinking of explanatory journalism as a New Yorker piece. It's a really long form, slow paced, uh, sometimes boring, but information-rich piece. Uh, but what I learned was it's, uh, there's an older tradition of that, but there's a real desire now to make sure that that information gets out there to the type of people who read it. So the people who read The New Yorker are different than the people who go to BuzzFeed. But BuzzFeed does a lot of really good explanatory journalism. They might do it through a listicle, which I think you know, three or four years ago was something people laughed at, but increasingly people are looking at as a pretty legitimate um, platform or format, rather, to, to get ideas out there. So millennials uh, and, and, uh, and others and, and Gen Xers, they like the information that explanatory journalism provides. They just need it packaged a little differently than baby boomers do. And, and so the outlets that are doing that well are connecting with people all across the divide. Washington Post, for instance, has a variety of different blogs and a variety of different um, uh, space on their, on their website. And you can see where they're appealing to millennials 
and where they're, they are appealing to baby boomers. And so, yeah, I don't think it's something that, I don't think it's a format or a medium that you have to peg toward a certain age group. You just have to be very innovative about how you do it. And what's more, you have to think about who is this content of interest to? So you can't just have any story that you target toward millennials, right? So if it's gonna be a story on how changes in uh, life expectancy among uh, the elderly is changing the solubility of social security, you probably don't wanna put that in a listicle. Um, millennials aren't gonna wanna read that. Uh, and so you, you format it in a way that, you know, people 50 and over are going to be more inclined to do it. If you are profiling, you know, uh, celebrity endorsements of presidential candidates and the types of issues that they're raising in their endorsements, yeah, that's probably something a listicle is going to work for, maybe a, a short interactive or, a, um, a, you know, uh, uh, something you scroll through. So thinking about what your content is, thinking about who your audience is or audiences are, and then choosing the right format for that is, is really critical. And I think it's not something that is naturally the way we think about the, the topic driving the packaging, but it's something we have to think about or, or else, again, the information isn't getting out. You got a question too? Sure. Um, I think there, there are, a f are a few parts of that. Donald Trump is absolutely saying things that some people are thinking and not saying themselves. That's undeniable. Um, you, you cannot possibly be that uncouth and think that people are not hiding some of those views. Then, of course, there are people who do say the things that uh, Donald Trump says out loud. We all have the uncles at Thanksgiving, right? And so uh, that's... that's um, that's part of the story. I think part of it too is that he is so um, uh, sort of quick-witted at times and so um, outrageous at other times that people are interested in it. People are interested in it even if they don't like him. I can't take my eyes off his, his speeches. I'm, I'm not a Donald Trump supporter, um, but I can't stop watching it because it is, as a political scientist, it's First off, history in the making, and second, awe-inspiring to see, as I said earlier, how he can be so successful at it. And so I watch to try to understand it. Um, and that motivates media to cover it because the interest is there. You know, uh, Hillary Clinton is not giving the type of speech that Donald Trump is giving. My guess is Hillary Clinton supporters like that, but media doesn't. And so they're covering where more eyes are gonna go, where more, um, you know, cursors are going to click. And so there's this, uh, there comes a point where there is a, a, or rather, let me back up. I'm not one to say that the media is wrong in their coverage, the amount of coverage they're necessarily giving to Donald Trump, because if their viewers want to see him, they're going, you know, you have to serve that purpose. Where I think the media has fallen down quite a bit with Trump is that he says things that are absolutely untrue, all presidential candidates do. Um, but he really goes the distance with it. And there's no uh, combating that from media. That is media's job to combat that. And there's, there hasn't been a real effective pushback against some of his claims, some of his arguments in ways that um, would be consistent with responsible journalism. And so I, that's a sort of uh, meandering answer to your question, but uh, th there was a lot in there. I, I do think, though, that uh, his appeal is not, certainly not just media's uh, doing, that there, he is sending a message, he's connecting on a message of anger, frustration, uh, feeling like you've been left behind, feeling like your government doesn't represent you, that a lot of people have. And there are some people who feel all of those things and that anger is really channeled into support for Trump. There are a lot of people, though, who feel those same things, um, who Trump isn't for them. And that said, for those people who are angry and reacting with anger politically, uh, 
there's, there's no better game in town than the messaging that, that Donald Trump is giving and, and no one else is even coming close. And when they try, they fail. Yes? It's a, it's a true struggle, um, you're right. If you are second to the party, uh, when you're writing on, these, uh, on topics like this, you're, you're really losing out. And, but that said, if you wanna get it right and if you wanna do it well, you really have to cozy up with something. The rescheduling piece uh, took us uh, months to get right, to, to really um, sop up all of the information, talk to all of the people who we needed to talk to first fully understand what we were, uh, the conclusions we were coming to, and then second, making sure we were right. We knew we had an opportunity to be the voice on this issue. And because of that, if we were wrong, it would have been devastating. It, it would have hurt Brookings' brand on marijuana policy in a very serious way. And all of that takes time. We didn't think anyone else was writing on this topic, and so we were able to Go, be more deliberative about it. But there are times where you know someone's gonna write about this soon. And so you have to balance uh, the best ways to do that. And, and sometimes it means taking a little smaller slice of a bigger project that you wanted to take. But the most important part is developing and refining your research skills. Um, that's something I do for a living and I'm refining them all the time, learning new things, learning new shortcuts, learning better sources or better ways to read and wade through information. Um, I do that um, and, and I spent you know, four years in college and then six years in graduate school and I still have to do that. Um, everyone has to do that, but especially, and especially journalists, especially policy, um, policy wonks. Uh, we have to figure out better ways, more effective, more efficient ways uh, to research so that then we can be speedier, we can be more accurate, and we can uh, face those trade-offs and make those choices over how much we're going to write about, how quickly we're going to get content out there in a much more responsible way. But at the end of the day, you're learning how to be uh, uh, journalists, uh, regardless of what your medium is, um, or communications professionals, um, but at the end of the day, in, in most ways, we're, we're still all researchers. And, and, and those are as primary of skills as the flow of your writing, the framing of your shot, um, and, and it's something to constantly think of as continuing education. <coughs> Sir? A specific question about the language you use, especially if you're uh, tackling a 40-page report, sure. and, you know, putting it into a blog, or if you're appealing to a specific audience, do you consciously think about the words you're using and maybe you know, dumb it down might not be the best terminology to use it, but to, to, to broaden it so that sure. a larger audience yeah, make it more accessible. That's the, that's the right language. But dumbing it down is pretty much right. No, you have to. You have to think about who, um, you're, who you're engaging, uh, who you want to engage, who you want to finish the piece. And so those choices over language are absolutely critical. You guys end up getting trained to write in very accessible, uh, smooth ways. In graduate school, you're trained in exactly the opposite way. You're trained to be boring, um, bloviated, technical, uh, it just awful writing, just some of the worst writing. Um, and so uh, for me, breaking out of that was very difficult, but it, it, extraordinarily difficult. But yeah, I, I'm very careful. There are times where I can't avoid some of the language that I use uh, because I have to, uh, I'm working on a paper right now that uh, looks at uh, good government, effective government stuff. But in it, I use some pretty base statistics, just correlations, uh, um, and that was a choice in itself. I have another separate academic paper that uses multivariate regression to make the point I'm making, but you know that's not gonna be what people wanna read uh, or what my audience has, has the capacity to um, uh, understand. They can understand correlations. They can understand a line, uh, you know, uh, a line chart. But within it, the way I calculate the measures that I'm correlating, I have to be technical because someone is going to ask, 
what is this measure, and if I don't present it technically, there can be a criticism of it. So there are some times you can't avoid it, but making sure that your readers are uh, on the same page and on the same wavelength as you is so key, because frankly, if you're writing too technically, or if you're writing too accessibly, too dumb, um, people are either going, people are gonna be insulted in either direction. They're either gonna think, this is, this is not the kind, uh, this is not a resource for me, this is just, you know, this is just a scientist writing. Or they're going to think, this guy thinks I'm a preschool student and I don't need to be spoken to like I'm an idiot. And so those choices, I think, in both directions are, are things that effective writers and effective scholars and uh, effective uh, insert whatever um, has to be, um, uh, really central to, to your approach and the way you think through things. In the back. Yeah, I have a question about research. Hello. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I find when I'm researching a topic is there's a saturation of information on the same subject. Sure. Uh, somebody somewhere in the world has told the story 5,000 times. So how do you, when you are researching Sure. So I think it's not a bad thing to be influenced by others' opinions and others' commentary. They're laying the groundwork for what you're doing. And, and if they're good ideas, they should be embraced and appreciated and uh, used to help, help inform what you're ultimately going to be writing about. There are definitely going to be topics out there that it's extraordinarily hard to have anything new to say about it. There's no doubt. Uh, but we all come at these issues from very different experiences, whether it's your training in school, whether it's the life that you've lived and the people who you know, or the uh, wor work that you've done in other areas. Uh, and the likelihood that someone has that same set of experiences is probably gonna be pretty slim. And so as you get this information and you see it through a certain lens, uh, your lens, uh, you probably have a pretty good ability to find out how to do something new. And so for me, in my research, I like to think about you know, where I come from, how the topics that I write about would affect uh, the community I grew up in or the community I live in now uh, or the people who I work with. I come from a very different background uh, than most of my, uh, my colleagues at Brookings. My colleagues at Brookings oftentimes are private school educated, well pedigreed individuals. Until I went to graduate school, I went to public school every day of my life, from kindergarten through, uh, through the day I graduated college. Um, I grew up very middle class. Um, uh, there were, you know, there were really tough months in my family. That's something that a lot of Brookings scholars never experienced but it makes me see the world in a very unique way. And so now from my perch, I will talk about issues in ways or think about things or make word choices that my colleagues don't. And for me, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to have come from a, a college like UNLV. I went to UConn, also the Huskies are on, so uh, you guys are special today that I'm not watching my basketball team. But um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the point is, that that experience uh, informs not how you conduct your research, but but the way in which you see the information and the way, if you think about it as theory building, which is something an academic does, but you guys are all building theory when you're working through the, the uh, issues that you're working through. Uh, those are the types of issues, uh, those are the types of ideas and, ex and lenses that help set you apart. That said, sometimes there's just nothing that can be done because so much, as you said, the saturation is so heavy. Uh, but most times there, there's going to be some ray that, that you're going to tell a, a more compelling story than the last man or woman. Yes? You mentioned balance, balancing uh, time and language, but here we've been drilled to kind of cut the fluff. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you balance information as far as using that? Sure. Um, I staff out cutting the fluff, which is really nice for me because I'm very bad at it. So I just write and write and write and write. You guys don't have that luxury. You absolutely don't. Um, although when I am writing on deadline, which is uncommon, but it, but it happens, 
I find uh, that I, I have to force myself uh, to, to be better at time and in, in information management. Frankly, it's just practice. Um, it's something I'm not trained in, and so it's much harder for me. That it's getting drilled into you is, is great. Um, and I wish I had some s sort of uh, magical solution or some great solution to how you balance that. I will say that um, get it, this is going to sound so basic, but taking better notes or being a better note taker is important. So everywhere I go, I have this notebook, and this is not, uh, not just because Brookings' name is on it, but I have a stack of these on my desk, and I write and I go through them, and as I g go through each, it's like a reporter's notebook, right? You keep your notes. Um, what that does for me, though, is it's a small space, so I have to be more efficient in how I take notes. And I, um, it's, I, and I find the right pen that I can write faster with. But the actual space that I'm writing on, and I, I use that for all note taking, whether it's taking down questions in a talk like this, whether it's actually working through primary materials. And what I've found is it has focused my ideas and forced me to condense things in a much more effective way and a much more efficient way, and then ultimately as a time saver, except when I go back and I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> that's the trouble. But, uh, but that's just sort of a little random, one-off, uh, sneaky move, but it's something that has transformed my research abilities in a, in a noticeable way. Yes? No, well, I, I'll say what our communications professionals um, uh, at Brookings, they, they love this type of uh, thing for two reasons. One, it's explanatory journalism is usually pretty good content, like I said, when you get it right. Uh, but two, their job is to make sure we get covered, that we get attention paid to us. I mean, that sounds extraordinarily selfish, but it's true. Um, and so for them, I know, they look at this medium and they say, these scholars don't know what the hell they're doing. They don't understand how to do this. They need their hand held, and we do. And so for them, it getting trained uh, as a communications professional in this type of medium is essential because as a public affairs or public relations person, you're going to have a lifetime of hand holding people. Um, and sometimes that's an easy day, and sometimes it's a really tough day. And so my, uh, my new communications director, she has a really interesting background in the types and variety of outlets that she's worked for, but she's a really strong writer, and she has a really good ear for uh, media and a really good intuition about uh, how your work is going to click or where, it's, where to pitch to best. I mean, pitching is such an underappreciated skill that is so complicated, and it's interpersonal, it's uh, interinstitutional, uh, and, and it's very topical. And part of all of that is how you're producing your work. And so I'll have a, a, um, uh, like a chat with uh, Liz, Liz is our, our, our comms director, in advance, and I'll say, here's what I'm going to write. Here are my ideas. Here are my findings. Here's the approach. What do you think this looks like? And sometimes it'll be, just make it short. Make it really short. Uh, make it direct. And here will be a great outlet to pitch it to. And other times it'll be, make it a little longer. You're not going to get it published in WAPO, you know, but you're going to have three or four reporters who are really interested in this topic and they want that deeper dive. And so getting training and knowledge about those, uh, those formats for a comms professional is just as important as, as it is for a journalist or for uh, a scholar writing on it. Yes? Sure. And do you feel like when there is um, 
I'm just gonna use this as an example because sure. I read it yesterday. Um, the autism spectrum, when people were doing testing and stuff on that at UCLA, the um, researcher had pinpointed one direction and it was kind of spun in a different way by journalists, um, kind of giving some misinformation to sure. parents. So where do you, what do you think that we can do to kind of bridge that gap, aside from what you're already doing, which is great? Sure, no, I, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. The, the ability to translate statistical information into something accessible to readers is something that I think the public is depending on journalists to do more and more over time. In part because journalists are doing it, but in part because they don't want to read my studies or Brookings studies or AEI studies or heritage studies. They'd rather get something that they can get a lot of information in a short period of time. The challenge is you're not trained in statistics, right? And so being able to read a detailed, uh, complicated, high-level statistical study and then translate that into uh, a better uh, packaging of the findings uh, can be tough and it's very risky. And you're right, you see some of these, there are some people who are really good at it. Um, and then there are people who are in a little over their head. And when they're in over their head, they really risk, like you said, putting out some misinformation and not in a, in a you know, mean-spirited way, not in a negative way, just you're in over your head. So I will say I think increasingly for journalists, and it's actually true for a lot of majors, uh, taking a statistics class is, is great if you can do it. They're scary, they're, they can be miserable, um, especially if you're coming from uh, you know, an, the arts side of the arts and sciences side, but it just makes you a better researcher, it makes you more informed, and if your public in your industry and in your sector is expecting you to do this, then you really have an obligation to do it well and to get more informed. It doesn't necessarily mean taking a stati statistics class here on campus. You can take them online. If, if math is something you're a little more comfortable with, you can pick up a book and uh, work through it that way. But a lot of journalists who I've talked to who are moving in this direction, they're going to like night classes or doing online uh, classes because they know the risks are so high if, if they fail at this uh, in terms of their brand, but also in terms of the information. If you're uh, giving people bad information about autism, that's, that's horrible. Uh, and you know some of it is lower risk than others, but when you're writing on, you, you guys at some points in your careers are gonna write on matters that are really important for people, life or death, or dollars and cents, and uh, and, and so, yeah, building that regimen, again, thinking of yourself as a researcher um, as much as you are a journalist or a communications professional is, is really an obligation, not a luxury, but an obligation. In the back. What about um, topics like climate change, which are extremely controversial? You have you know, certain you know, sections of uh, experts who believe one way and then sure. some Sure. So on an issue like climate change, but a lot of other issues, uh, hot button issues, this is a challenge. And so for me, I tend not to take too many political positions in my work. There are times when I, I do that, but we write entirely independent and nonpartisan uh, at Brookings. I mean, individually, we, we have our own views, but as an institution, institution we don't. And good journalism is going to do the same thing, not inject your own personal politics, but at the end of the day, there are right answers. And what you have to do first is, again, back to the research skills, identify the angle that someone is coming from when they're writing. So for instance, if you see someone writing from uh, the Heritage Foundation on climate change, you have to appreciate that it's a very conservative institution. It's a, an institution that has gone on record um, uh, you know, denying climate change, or at least some of the people there um, ha have done so. And so they clearly come to it with a pre-existing set of political beliefs that they don't necessarily keep out of their work. 
The same is true on the left. Very liberal um, uh, think tanks do the same thing. And so always skeptical of uh, the primary source material or the secondary source material that you're using in the same way, are you a journalism student or in communications? Journalism. Okay, so in the same way that when you're sourcing a story, you're thinking about, well, what biases does the source bring to the table? Do I have to go to another source uh, to double check, or should I have an offsetting source? So when you're reading an article, think of it the same way as you know, cold calling um, someone that you're, you're uh, using to do some reporting. And if those biases are too much, it t and you think it's compromising the work, you don't use the source. So you find sources on the topic who you think are writing in a more straightforward way, in a more genuine and honest way. Uh, on marijuana policy, for instance, you have organizations on both sides of the issue, opposed and supportive, who will take the same report and cherry pick findings from it to show you that marijuana is killing children or marijuana is curing every disease in the world with magnificent results and everything in between. So you look at this and you, you recognize that, you know, uh, the, again, the manipulation of data um, is something that, that uh, biased sources are going to seize on, but then you find the sources that, uh, if at all, can remove their personal bias or remove as much as possible their personal bias or are frankly just upfront about it, because some people are in, in their writing and just say, you know, this is, uh, this is who I am and this is how I think and here's some information. That's much less common, but, but yeah, it's, it's just something you have to weigh, but something you have to be extraordinarily careful in weighing because if you don't catch that angle, then you look like the fool because you're the one reproducing information that has a, a, a real slant that you think was pretty balanced. <laughs> Roadblocks? Oh yeah. Oh gosh. So um, when, when you're working with government data, a lot of times the availability of it is difficult. And some of it's online, some of it is not online. So I was doing some work on, a, on the EPA, a, a, a project on EPA's uh, super, super fun sites and I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for data. Publicly available data, nothing uh, in it had anything that was confidential or classified or anything like that. And it took months and months and months. And it was denied at first. Um, and then I had to file an appeal. And that took months. And so finally you get a disk. Um, finally it went through and you get a disk and it is horrendously formatted data. So now a project that if I got the data in a reasonable format when I asked for it, the analysis could have been done pretty quickly, a couple of weeks. The project ended up taking an extra year and a half to do it. And uh, it's sort of the nature of the beast. When I was, uh, I was talking to someone on campus the other day when I was writing my dissertation, it was, uh, I collected all federal spending data uh, from federal grants from 1996 to 2011. And the format that those data came in were at the state level by quarter. So not by year, but by quarter. And so for 15 years, by 50 states, by four quarters, um, that's a lot of, you had to individually download every, you couldn't even download like a zip. You had to click because the interface was so screwy. They don't use this anymore um, at the source, but they did then. So downloading every individual um, file, then formatting every individual file so it was in the right, with the right way to use it, and then combining all of those into a macro file, again, uh, took, made the work years longer than it, over a year longer than it, than it should have. Uh, and so yeah, those roadblocks happen all the time. They happen uh, running into people who don't want to talk to you. So some of my work is qualitative. Some of it is getting into the field and talking to people. A lot of my marijuana policy research is that. So I'm out there working like a reporter in some sense. And as you guys know, until you build connections, until you get your name out there, until you've established yourself as someone who's legitimate and honest and trustworthy in that space, doors aren't opening for you. And in an area of policy like marijuana, where people are extraordinarily worried and skeptical and fearful of what 
angle someone is going to have or whether you're trying to, uh, to you know, expose some kind of wrongdoing. It was really hard when I first started researching in this area just to get people to talk to me. And now it's easier. Now that I've written a ton of things on it, it's a lot easier. But starting out, and you guys are starting out, it, I wish I could say there, there are shortcuts. It's just constant, uh, constantly being relentless uh, to try to uh, get people who you know have the information you need to give it to you. And uh, all of these are delays. And like your question before, how do you make the uh, choices over time management and research? Sometimes there are ways that you can uh, you know, get around it by a smaller notebook, but there's no way to get around data that is essential that takes forever to get or to format or to go through the process of waiting until the, the interviews start coming in and the people start uh, becoming a little more talkative. Yes? Okay, thanks. Where do I see myself in five years? I really love my job. I have to say, I, I really do. Um, I'm, I consider myself extraordinarily lucky uh, to uh, be where I am uh, every year. The, uh, an organization ranks uh, the world's think tanks and uh, Brookings uh, for the past, I think since they started doing it, has been the top think tank in the United States and in the world. Uh, so I in terms of working at a think tank, it doesn't get better than, it doesn't get better than this. And uh, my colleagues are great. My, uh, our, our communications team is wonderful. Uh, our partnerships here and around the world are great. Um, I just got back last week from uh, Doha. We have uh, a, a Brookings Doha Center, which does some really interesting uh, work, mostly on Middle East policy, but um, they had me over to talk about the 2016 election. Our partnership with Brookings Mountain West is one of our most valuable. It lets us get into um, uh, an area of the country that needs a lot of help in terms of transforming public policy in a way that helps citizens and communities. And I can come out here and meet with people and talk to them about ideas like this, marijuana policy, federal spending policy, and have real impact in a way that uh, if my goal is to try to get Congress to do something, eh, it doesn't happen too often. So uh, no, it's, it's extraordinarily, um, it, it's, it's extraordinarily exciting to be where I am. I have no idea what five years will hold, but I, I know this, I, I love my work, I love the place I work, and I live in a city where my wife has a job that she absolutely adores as well, and life doesn't get better than that. A happy wife and a happy job. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.